मेरा नाम पर आंसर है इतना टफ हो गया है देखो भी टफ हुआ था एंड आई सॉ दिन मिश्रा भी नहीं है आराध्या है
started with
here in this chapter two diagrams you will be asked to draw one is the excretory system and the other is the structure of the nephron both we have to draw so the other day i had asked you to draw the diagram of the excretory system find out if everybody has done we we'll talk about the structure of the nephron and the process of uh, filtration but before that uh, we try understanding that what are some of the waste substances to be released out what are some of the waste substances to be released out carbon dioxide <coughs> by the way of the lungs carbon dioxide how is it produced carbon dioxide is produced as a result of cellular respiration cellular respiration in the tissues we talk about uh the main nitrogenous waste substances which are the main nitrogenous waste substances to be released out the main nitrogenous waste substances to be released out is the urea apart from urea uric acid but urea uric acid you will be asked questions may name the two main organic substances released by the kidney two main organic substances urea and uric acid where are they formed the site of formation is liver How are they formed by the breakdown of the excess amino acids? By the breakdown of the excess amino acids. Now, if we take in the protein food, the protein food given to whom? Now that we talk about the breakdown of uh, the protein food inside our intestine, the breakdown of the protein food inside the intestine, uh, this will lead to the formation of uh, amino acids, and these amino acids, the digestion or absorbable products. Uh, enter into the blood, and by the way of the blood will enter into the liver. Now that in the in the liver, what next? These amino acids will get further broken down and release urea uh, in the process of uh, breaking down the amino acid to some other sources of carbohydrate. Actually, the amino acid get converted into some other sources of carbohydrate, and in that process. Uh, urea is formed, and what is that process known as deamination? Deamination. So that we have to take a note. Oh, why is it different between urea and nitrogen? Composition, the elemental composition, the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Urea is more toxic, and urea is less soluble. In, uh, urea is uh, more soluble in water as in comparison with uric acid. I talk about the composition of uric acid is even more uh, complex. Urea is little bit more uh, uh, stable. You talk about uric acid, uh, always released in the uh, quite dry form, dry form, solid form, crystalline form, and it is not soluble in water much. But urea is soluble in water. And what is urea and nitrogen? These are nitrogenous waste substances. I told you just now that urea and uric acid are formed in the liver by the breakdown of the amino acids. The amino acids from where will the amino acids come in the liver? Amino acids are the products of digestion. These are the absorbable forms of uh, protein. We take in the protein food, no? And the protein has to be digested in the small intestine. So the protein will always be broken down to the amino acids. Then, by the way of blood, they will enter into the liver. Then next is when we talk about that, what are the other substances to be released out? Uh, the excess salt. Which type of salt? Do you remember sodium chloride? Sodium chloride present in our body already. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a little doubt of the same. Uh, but is there any difference between urea and uric acid? There is a lot of it. I just now told him also that when I talk about urea, uric acid, these are two different type of compounds formed from uh, the amino acids. Amino acids. Amino, acids. amino acids, but. Properties, structural, structural properties, and as it is, when I talk about the structural properties of urea, these are molecules. These are also biomolecules. These are now these biomolecules. See, as the arrangement of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen is different. Number two, their solubility in water, their uh, solubility in the plasma, all these things are different. Their pH would be different. So chemical composition, physical properties are different. So uric acid is uh, formed lesser in our body. In our body, more of urea is formed. Uric acid will be formed majorly in the body of the reptiles and the birds. So that's the reason in the waste substances of the birds and the reptiles, you will find more of more of them are in the most of them are in the solidified form. You no, know, the uric acid 
So these are, these are not the uh, waste products of digestion I'm generally talking about, even the uh, products after filtration of blood by the way of the kidneys also in the solidified form, uric acid. I think you must have gone home. So now when we are talking about what else has to be released out, I thought you went home. No, I'm going to stop me there. That's right. Put on this. Okay. Hmm. He started chatting with Rekha Gandhi. I don't know. Put up no, the words. That also. You don't want? Bank of the air. You want my head to be frozen? You want my head to be frozen? You want my head to be frozen? Done. Keep your bag down, take out your notebook, take out your book. Why are you hiding? Move this side. Comfortable. This book, you can set what are the other substances that has to be released out? What are the other substances by pigments? Wild pigments always form here, we will have to remember this. Wild pigments always form by the breakdown of hemoglobin. What are the wild pigments? Bilirubin, bilirubin. How are bilirubin, bilirubin formed? Where are bilirubin, bilirubin formed? Bilirubin, bilirubin are formed by the breakdown of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin of the dead RBCs, which are entering the liver by the process of blood circulation. Circulatory system, we have finished here? Yes. yes. Sir. So you are already aware that when we talk about the RBCs, they have got a specific lifespan, and after that, they will enter into the liver stage. So after this particular lifespan is over, they will enter into the liver stream for the process of their destruction, and they, the hemoglobin breaks out. And the liver is also destroyed liver Where? Liver. Where? The blood is destroyed. RBC in the liver. Mainly in the liver, still in the end. So mainly in the liver, where the hemoglobin will get disintegrated to form uh, bilirubin bilirubin. What next? But now we are talking about the excretory product. This bilirubin bilirubin will further get broken down to form a pigment known as urochrome. The bilirubin bilirubin will get further broken down to form a pigment known as urochrome. Always you are asked this question. Name the pigment responsible for the yellowish tinge of the urine, the color of the urine. The slight yellowish tinge is because of urochrome. How is urochrome formed? The breakdown of bilirubin bilirubin. So this is what you have to understand. Now next is we talk about what are some of the excretory glands there. Uh, some of the excretory structures, accessory excretory structures if I have to say, that, that, should, be what, that should be the sweat glands. Why the sweat glands? Uh, because the sweat glands are uh, filtering the blood uh, to produce the sweat. Sweat glands also filter the blood. Uh, talk about deep down inside the heart, inside the skin, the sweat glands and the blood vessels are just parallel like this, very close. And uh, a lot of diffusion of substances from the blood vessel is entering inside the sweat gland. So by the process of diffusion, a lot of water, salts and urea starts entering here. So this uh, sweat, which is now coming over the surface of the skin, has got water, salts and traces of urea. So that's why we say that uh, this sweat can also be considered as an excretory product and the sweat gland as an accessory excretory gland, excretory structure. Lungs, of course, because it gives away the carbon dioxide. And kidney is the major organ for excretion. And the liver also, not to forget, the liver is also considered as an excretory organ. Explain, give reason, what could I? The liver is known as an excretory organ, considered as an excretory organ because it produces 
urea, urea by the breakdown of ammonia, uh, by the breakdown of by the breakdown of amino acid. Read up, what is it? Liver also breaks down bad cholesterol, alcohol, and nicotine. So that's the reason the liver is also. Now, say, suppose a person who is alcoholic, a person who is a, a smoker, it is the liver only which the part of the body that is the liver which is constantly clearing of all these toxic substances. So if we did not have the liver, if the liver does not function in our body, then we have to be very, very specific in the type of substances entering in our body. But are we, do we ever think that what we are consuming, what we are eating, quite a number of times food rich in preservatives, yes we do eat, quite a number of times uh, high protein diet, which our body would generally not uh, be able to adjust if the liver would not have been there. And forget about all the poisonous toxic substances like alcohol and etc. etc. So the liver constantly keeps on clearing of all the waste and the toxic substances of our body. The human excretory system, this diagram we have drawn the other day. And say that all of you have completed drawing this, you will get this in your diary, in your exams for drawing three mark. In this diagram, what are you supposed to remember? The parts of the excretory system. Uh, the two part, the two uh, kidneys, the other day also I told you that these two kidneys, a pair of kidneys, what is their location on either side of the vertebral column? Above the above the hip region, on the dorsal side, side of the on either side of the backbone, just now I said, and on the dorsal side, this is the dorsal side of our body, and just above the hip. Now uh, one one condition to also remember that the right kidney is which lower because of the position of the liver. What are the two functions of the kidney? You are asked. Mention the two functions of the kidney. What are the two points you are supposed to write down? One is filtration of the blood. And what is the second point you write? Osmo regulation. What is the first function of the kidneys? The first function of the kidney is the filtration of the blood. And the second function of the kidney is osmoregulation. What is the second function of the kidney osmoregulation? That is the maintenance of the salt and the water balance of the body. This you will get for two more questions in your paper. Write down the uh, specific functions. Write down the specific functions of the kidney. Two functions of the kidney. So the two functions of the kidney exactly these two points to write down. Exactly these two points to write. Filtration of the blood and maintenance of salt and water balance, that is osmoregulation. Let us continue with the parts and their functions. A tube-like structure which emerges out from the kidney, known as the ureter. Now that just now we said filtration of the blood, filtration of the blood and do what? By the process of filtration of the blood, now next what? Filtration of the blood and uh, result in the formation of the urea. And we are going to learn later that it is during the process of urine formation where the uh, salt and the water balance of our body gets maintained and something that we call it as osmoregulation. Now here, uh, we will look at the structure of the kidneys uh, later. But first of all, we try understanding that this urine uh, will be carried by the ureter to the bladder. Bladder is a muscular sac-like structure. The other day also I told you it's a muscular sac-like structure which can move the urine for a short period of time. What is the function of the ureter to write? Carries, helps in the passage of the urine from the kidney to the blood. And then another tube like structure known as the urethra. What is the job of the urethra? The job of the urethra is to drain the urine from the bladder outside the body. Wherever you are asked to write, differences between ureter and urethra. Now, what is the reason that the urine which is collected in the bladder? Do not go backward because at the junction of the ureter and the bladder, uh, the other day I told you that if I talk about the bladder here, if this is the urinary bladder that we understand, and if it is a tube here, the, ure uh, the ureter which is entering inside. Say, suppose I talk about the internal regions here. <laughs> now, this is the ureter which is inside. Uh, very close, we are going to come across with this, this urine which is now entering. Will it again revert and go back? Does it ever go back again? It does not go back. What is the reason that it does not go back? Because there are some muscular flap-like structures. There are some muscular flap-like structures. Some muscular flap-like structures are there 
all over this particular region on the wall of the bladder. <coughs> so, so, this muscular flap like structures, when the urine is getting diverted into the bladder, this muscular flap like structures they contract and almost <coughs> narrow down this passage. Almost narrow down this passage so that the urine cannot take a back flow. So apart from this, there again are some sphincter muscles on the inner wall of the urethra. So as the urine is passing through uh, the urethral tube, if you have to understand this, uh, is it possible that the urine again take a back flow? No, because of the urethral or the sphincter muscles, which will again relax and close the pathway. And whatever amount of urine has come down, uh, has to be released out of the body. So what is this process of release of the urine under nervous impulse known as, this is what is known as maturation. What is maturation? The definition is important. What is maturation? The release of the urine from the bladder under nervous impulse. What else? We talk about the blood vessel. Now what is this blood vessel? This particular blood vessel is the vena cava. Let me start with this first. I talk about this particular blood vessel. That is the dorsal aorta. Now that already we have completed with the circulatory system, this dorsal aorta you are very much aware. Uh, starts from which chamber? Dorsal aorta starts from which chamber? Dorsal aorta starts from left ventricle. Left ventricle, this entire structure of the heart and all these things you'll have to remember. Keep reading, keep revising. The dorsal aorta starts uh, from the left ventricle. So, what type of blood does it carry? Oxygenated. oxygenated. Now, it carries oxygenated blood, but remember the blood is rich and loaded with nitrogenous waste like urea uric acid. So, this dorsal aorta uh, will break down into the renal arteries from branches. And this renal artery will enter into the kidneys. But the moment it enters into the kidneys, we are going to come across that the moment it enters into the kidneys, we are going to look into uh, that the moment, it, the moment it enters into the kidneys, uh, this renal uh, artery, let me just show you one more. <coughs> This renal artery that I am talking about, this renal artery, the moment it enters into the fine tubular structures of the kidney, what are those fine tubular structures of the kidney known as? This is all, this entire tubular structure is known as the nephron. Where are these nephrons present if I have to look into uh, the section of a kidney? I'll talk about a section of the kidney now. And in this section of the kidney, what are some of the parts to come across? I would say that this particular region would be termed as the cortex. This particular region is the cortex. And this particular region would be now termed as the medulla. The uh, longitudinal section of the kidney shows two distinct parts. The outer cortex and the inner medulla. This particular inner medullary region again can be divided into uh, certain column-like structures like this, uh, some triangular pyramid-like structures this way. So when we are looking into the medullary region, the medullary region is always known to have uh, this type of triangular structures is known to have this type of some triangular structures. What are these called? These are known as the renal pyramids. So some uh, fine bristle-like structures as if are packed up here. Some fine bristle-like structures are packed up here and which are grouped to form some triangular pyramids. What are these known as? These are known as the renal pyramids. These are known as the renal pyramids. Next what? This renal pyramids, uh, when you look into the entire structure of the kidney, the renal pyramids will all divert this entire uh, conical ends, if I talk about, this entire conical ends that are there, this will all divert to result in the formation of a wider structure here. And this is known as the renal pelvis. 
this is known as the renal pelvis so first of all i say that this particular triangular structure what are these lobulated structures known as these lobulated structures are known as the renal pyramid what is this renal pyramid made up of the renal pyramids are made up of uh, some bristle like structures and every single bristle like structure is actually a part of the nephron we will understand that and uh, then uh, the urine which has been conducted actually will come out from each of these structures like this okay and uh, will be drained here into the broad part of the ureter and this broad part of the ureter is known as the renal pelvis which emerges out from a notch like structure here and this is what is known as the hilum of the kidney where is the hilum present on the convex or the concave side on the concave side of the kidney on the concave side huh? next is what next is when you look into this entire uh, region okay something more that i understand here is that look into this conical projection this conical projection uh this conical projection if you see here look at this particular diagram also uh when we try finding out this conical projection see here can you see this part where the entire pyramid ends this entire part where the entire pyramid ends okay. and when it ends there is actually a tube like structure there there is a tube like structure when it ends there is a tube like structure when it ends there is a tube like structure can you see here and all these tube like structures they again actually unite together to actually form the pelvis so there are distinct tube like structures here so if i have to draw this specifically i should draw that this is one tube like structure then this is another tube like structure which will get merged with this perhaps uh, then this is another tube like structure this is another tube like structure then there is again one more tube like structure so there are so many tube like structures which are formed exactly see here tube like structures one after the other tube like structures what is this conical region known as this is known as the renal papilla what is this particular region known as this is known as the renal papilla so if i show you here where is the renal papilla this is where the renal pyramid ends this is where the renal pyramid ends and uh, here there is one tube like structure then again i understand that this is done and then here again there is a tube like structure so exactly this particular region is known as exactly this particular region is known as the renal papilla the conical end of the renal pyramid the conical ends of the renal pyramids are known as the renal papilla the conical ends of the renal pyramids are known as the renal papilla this is one this is one this is one the renal papilla so renal pyramids renal papilla the pelvis the ureter the hilum so these are the major parts to understand then we have the cortex and we have the medullary region you get questions that the cortex generally appears strip uh, i'm sorry uh, dotted the cortex generally appear dotted why and the medulla appears stripped the medulla appears stripped and the cortex always appears dotted uh, so why does the cortex appear dotted because if i draw in another diagram the basic structure of the kidney then i should be showing you that if this is the cortical region uh, the part of the nephron uh, would generally start like this and then go down and then again come up and then again finish up like this so every particular nephron every particular nephron what is a nephron what are its parts we are going to come across every particular this nephron that we talk about starts from the cortex and goes down till the medulla and again comes up and results in the formation of a structure something like this so i would understand that it would always start from here and then a part of the tubular structure here 
and then come up and then finish up something like this. So what are these tubular structures inside the kidney in large numbers known as, in millions known as? These tubular structures are known as the nephrons. Every single nephron has got a head-like structure, a globular head-like structure and a very, very long tubular part. A very long tubular part. Now, when I talk about the strict appearance of the medulla, these are the regions which are in the medulla. And these are the regions which are in the cortex. So why does the cortex appear dotted? Majorly because of the presence of this particular region and partly the PCG. We'll mention now this. And why does the cortex, uh, the medulla appear strict? Because of these type of uh, slender, long, thin, uh, tube-like structures, bristle-like structures, packed up. But before that, before answering that question, let us learn the parts of the nephron in detail. What are the parts of the nephron? The parts of the nephron would be something like this. I start with the renal artery. In the previous diagram, we have started with the dorsal aorta, which divides to form the renal artery as it enters into the kidney. As it enters into the kidneys. Now, talk about the renal artery. Start from here. This renal artery would again result in the formation of finer, finer vessels. And this vessel is known as the afferent arteriole, which would enter into the nephrons, individual nephrons, individual part of the kidneys. But now that this afferent arteriole enters into the uh, nephrons, it actually breaks up into a large number of capillaries resulting into a formation of a ball of blood capillaries and now something known as the glomerulus. Glomerulus. And this glomerular capillaries will again unite to form a narrower tube known as the efferent arteriole. And this efferent arteriole will leave the nephron now, the globular head of the nephron now. And this entire knot of blood capillaries, the, uh, the, the entire ball like structure of the uh, blood capillaries are all packed inside a double wall top shaped structure which is hollow from inside and this is known as the Bowman's capsule. Uh, we continue with the Bowman's capsule that this Bowman's capsule will now result in what? This Bowman's capsule will now uh, get extended into a very very long coiled and thin and narrow tube like structure which can be again divided into three parts the first part is known as the proximal part of the tubule. Proximal meaning nearer. Nearer to what? Nearer to the Bowman's capsule or the glomerulus. Then we have a very long tubular part known as the loop of family. And then we have got the DCT, this part, the DCT followed by the collective cap. So this is the entire tubular part. The three main parts are what? The PCT the loop of Henry and the DCT. Follow the blood vessels. Uh, this efferent arteriole again breaks up as it comes out and results in the formation of a network of blood capillaries surrounding the tubular part. But these blood capillaries will again unite together resulting in the formation of a vein. And what is this vein now known as? The renal vein. Renal artery, efferent arteriole, glomerulus, efferent arteriole, and a whole network of blood capillaries. What are these blood capillaries called? Secondary capillaries, peritubular capillaries. We will draw this diagram now. And these capillaries will again unite back, resulting in the formation of the renal vein. So the blood in the renal artery always has a higher concentration of urea uric acid and the blood which is passing through the nephron is now purified, filtered already. So the blood which is present in this capillaries also is not completely uh, filtered but after a lot of processes happening here, the blood which is drained into this renal vein is quite a lot purified and free from urea uric acid. So differences between renal artery, renal vein that you write, 
we'll have to remember all these differences. The first difference as of now I talk about is high concentration of urea and uric acid, low concentration of urea and uric acid. So this is the first difference to remember. Let us first of all draw the diagram of the nephron and learn all the basic parts and their functions and the process also we have to come across, the process of formation of the urea. Take out your pencils and first of all we will draw the diagram of the nephron. Diagram of the nephron with all the parts, blood vessels. In their diameter, in their uh, permeabilities. Diameter, uh, structurally, they have got a lot of differences. One is very broad, we'll draw also. This diagram you get for drawing. Uh, diagram, uh, the, there is a structural difference and permeability differences also a lot. What difference can you get from maturation? What difference can you get from maturation? Maturation, the process of release of urine from the bladder. Process of release of urine from the bladder under nervous impulse. Under nervous impulse. Start drawing the diagram, all of you. Start, start.
These two diagrams that we had drawn, you have to practice. It comes in the exam. You have to draw these diagrams. So practice a little bit so that you can draw the paths properly. Here, take a note when you are drawing the diagram, the apron arterial, you always draw broad. 
as the efferent arterial, you always draw narrower. This tubular portion and the blood capillaries, how will you differentiate? You are not supposed to use colors, but you will make these black <laughs> lines, meaning the tubular part, you will draw a bit darker. And the blood capillaries, you draw lighter. So that's how you should make your diagram neat and uh, the two different parts distinguishable. The tubular part of the nephron, make it dark when you draw. So this entire, these lines that I've drawn in black, you have to make it a bit darker. And the parts which are drawn, the blood vessels, still here, not a problem, it is easily understood. This part, the blood vessels, you can, you have to keep it a little bit lighter. Done. Now, this is the structure of a nephron. Where do we find this nephron? Inside the kidneys. Millions of nephrons in one kidney always. What are the different parts of the nephron? First of all, let us try understanding the parts of the nephron. The globular head-like structure that the nephron has. The globular head-like structure consists of what? A knot of blood capillaries, a network of blood capillaries known as the glomerulus. And this network of blood capillaries is as if fit into a double wall cup shaped structure. So there's a double wall cup shaped structure. See the inner layer, the inner layer. Actually, this is considered as the outer layer also when I talk about the, uh, the cavity not being formed. So here, this particular layer is perforated. This particular layer, the inner layer of the Bowman's capsule, this is perforated and the outer layer is even. And uh, the blood capillaries are just fit inside as if it's a socket-like structure being formed, a cavity, a depression has been formed, a concavity has been formed here. And which are those blood vessels? The renal artery, the afferent arteriole. How is the afferent arteriole formed? By the division of the renal artery. The renal artery carry oxygenated blood, but blood rich in urea, uric acid, nitrogenous <coughs> Next, these capillaries will unite together and form another blood vessel known as the efferent arteriole. But the efferent arteriole is narrower than the afferent. What is the significance? What is the, uh, how, does the, the how does this help in the process of urine formation that we will come across? Then this efferent arteriole will again break up into a number of blood capillaries and these blood capillaries are always found to wrap around the entire tubular part. They wrap around the entire tubular part of the nephron this way. Then which are the main parts, the tubular part of the nephron? Which are the first part? Which is the first one? The first one is the PCT, also known as proximal convoluted tubular. The first part of the tubular region, which is the first part of the tubular region, PCT. This PCT is comparatively broader and of course, it is also extensively coiled. Uh, what about the locations now? Let us talk about what are the locations. Uh, this glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule together forms the Malpighian body. Now, where is the Malpighian body located? The Malpighian body is located in the cortex. Where is this PCT located? I told you this PCT, the first part of the tubule, this is also located in the cortex. The PCT is also located in the cortex. And a small portion of the PCT runs down into the medullary region. See here. When I talk about the PCT, majority of the region of the PCT is all inside the cortex, in the cortex region. 
but a small portion was come down. This is a small portion which is coming down into the medullary region and then starts forming the loop of Hanley. Where is this loop of Hanley? The loop of Hanley in the medulla. The loop of Hanley again almost terminates at the junction of the cortex and medulla. And now where is the DCT? The DCT is also in the cortex. Where is the DCT? The DCT is absolutely in the cortex. Then what about the loop of, then what about the collecting duct? The collecting duct is majorly in the medullary. The collecting duct is majorly in the medullary region. Now I go back to that concept where I said that talk about the longitudinal section of the kidney. We look into the longitudinal section of the kidney. So when we talk about the longitudinal section of the kidney, what did we come across? That there are these type of structures, no? These type of some renal or what was the name of this? These are known as renal pyramids. These are known as renal pyramids. So now when I say that this entire region of the medulla appears stripped, what is the reason? that the, the medullary region appears stripped and what is the reason that the cortical region appears dotted? The reason you are supposed to write that the cortical region appears dotted because of the presence of the malpighian body, the PCT and the DCT. All of it. Majorly the malpighian body and the PCT. And why does the medullary region appear stripped? because of the presence of these two structures, the loop of Hanley and the long collecting duct, which ultimately appear like fine brush borders, fine bristle-like structures. So this entire structure looks like brush borders as in bristles as in. And this entire region gives a head-like structure, a globular structure, under magnification, low magnification. So this entire region gives a knob-like structure, a head-like structure, and this entire structure gives a bristle-like structure. So these are the two questions you'll have to remember. Write it down first. Why does the cortex appear dotted and the medulla appear stripped? Why does the cortex of the kidney appear dotted and the medulla appear stripped? This is a very common two mark question. So remember that you write the parts properly. The cortex appears dotted because of the presence of cortex appear dotted because of the location of because of the location of the Malpighian body because of the location of the Malpighian body. because of the location of the Malpighian body and the PCT and DCT in the cortex. PCT and DCT in the cortex. Next sentence. The medulla appears stripped. The medulla appears stripped because of the location of medulla appear strip because of the location of the loop of Hanley and collecting duct because of the location of the loop of Hanley and collecting duct in the medulla loop of Hanley and collecting duct in the medulla So what did we come across right now is that when we talk about the basic structure of a nephron, so what are the parts of a nephron to understand? The parts of a nephron would be like this. We talk about the uh, efferent arteriole. What did I tell you just now? That the efferent arteriole would again branch, uh, result in the, in the uh, will divide profusely, resulting in the formation of a network of capillaries. What are these network of capillaries known as? Peritubular capillaries, also known as vasa recta. But 
this vasa recta is formed how is vasa recta formed vasa recta is formed by the division of the efferent arteriole which is emerging out from the nephron but on the other side this vasa recta or the capillaries the secondary capillaries or the peritubular capillaries they will again unite to form the other blood vessel and what is this blood vessel known as this is known as the renal vein this is the renal vein then what are the other parts left that we have to talk about now we look into that this particular bowman's capsule what is it made up of it is made up of epithelial tissues and this layer of the epithelial cells are arranged in such a manner that there are some small spaces in between so we would say that this layer of the bowman's capsule is porous the particular layer the inner layer of the bowman's capsule is always porous because of the arrangement of the cells epithelial cells generally epithelial cells are all compact but this particular layer of epithelial cells or the special group of epithelial cells are there and uh, making spaces in between and making the entire layer porous so now these are the major features structural features now we have to understand that with all these features how does the process of filtration of blood takes place to understand the process of filtration of the blood now we have to talk about three steps three processes which are the three processes now okay one more definition that you have to remember define glomerulus what are you supposed to write a knot of blood capillaries i want all of you to write down these are very basic very common questions define glomerulus what will you write a network of blood capillaries or a knot of blood capillaries this is what is also very commonly written a knot of blood capillaries formed by the division of efferent arteriole a knot of blood capillaries formed by the division of efferent arteriole okay formed by efferent arteriole and then we we'll have to talk about the process of urine formation what is the process of filtration of the blood or urine formation we are going to study three processes which are those three processes one would be ultra filtration the second is selective reabsorption selective reabsorption and the third would be tubular secretion and the third would be tubular secretion we we'll have to learn all these three steps to understand how filtration of the blood takes place resulting in the formation of the urine you want to read tell you no yes yes okay okay nobody will go out huh? no going down don't be late stay here only there is no need to eat chips and all this Let it be. I'll change. Oh, yeah. You can do this one here. 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 अरे पहले इधर बैठ रहे वो सीन तो है ना तो उसके कारण है
what is the definition of ultrafiltration? The filtration of the blood that takes place in the glomerular capillaries at a very high pressure. That is what is ultrafiltration. Now, but then, when I talk about ultrafiltration, the definition, what I told you right now is uh, the filtration of blood at a very high pressure. Why the filtration of blood should happen at a very high pressure? Because if I talk about the glomerular capillaries, the blood is being brought by the afferent arteriole, which is at a or which is having a greater diameter, which is of a greater diameter as in comparison with the efferent arteriole. The efferent arteriole is narrow, the efferent arteriole is broad. So whatever amount of blood is brought here every time, uh, the same amount of blood cannot leave the nephron. So every time there is a pressure being created here because of the wider diameter of the efferent and the narrow diameter of the efferent arteriole. What is the big reason that the process of ultrafiltration takes place? One of the most important reasons, there are three, four different types of reasons, three, four different types of pressures. But the most important reason is the hydrostatic pressure of the blood that takes place or that is developed here at the glomerular capillaries. The hydrostatic pressure of the blood. What is the most important reason for the process of ultrafiltration? The most important reason that always you should write is the hydrostatic pressure that is developed at the glomerular capillaries. Now, why the hydrostatic pressure? Why is the hydrostatic pressure developed? The hydrostatic pressure is developed because of the wider efferent arteriole and the narrow efferent arteriole. Wider efferent arteriole and narrow efferent arteriole. Okay? So, as a result of glomerular filtration, as a result of ultrafiltration, what happens and the rest of the processes. So we now talk about that as a result of ultrafiltration, what would happen? To understand this, say suppose I talk about the Bowman's capsule. Now this is the Bowman's capsule. Uh, what are some properties of the Bowman's capsule we have understood? The Bowman's capsule is a double wall cup shaped structure. And the inner layer of the Bowman's capsule is perforated. The inner layer that you have to understand is perforated. And with reference to this, we are going to understand how would the process of ultrafiltration also be favored. So I start this way that any particular blood capillary, now say suppose this is the blood capillary that I understand. And what is this particular vessel? Efferent arteriole, the blood capillaries, and then the efferent arteriole. So we start this way. This is the efferent. And this is the efferent arteriole. The efferent and the efferent arteriole. The blood enters at a very high pressure. And this is what? These are the glomerular capillaries that we are talking about. These are the glomerular capillaries, the glomerulus. Now, as the blood is passing into the glomerular capillaries, first of all, try understanding what are some of the properties of these glomerular capillaries also. Every single glomerular capillary that we talk about has got two basic properties. What are the two basic properties of this glomerular, structural properties of the glomerular capillaries? The wall is extremely thin. And the wall has pores. So when I talk about two special properties of the glomerulus, what are the two properties? Wall extremely thin. And the second property is it is porous. The glomerular capillaries are extremely thin wall and porous. So now that the blood is moving here, how would the blood, what would happen to the blood? The blood is moving here at a very, very high pressure. So as the blood moves in this glomerular capillaries at a very high pressure, some amount or some of the liquid substances starts getting uh, filtered. Or I would say uh, some of the liquid substances of the blood starts oozing out. Oozing out uh, through this small pores and certain amount of salts and ions starts diffusing through the very thin walls. Clear? 
So now this particular process which is happening that we try understanding as ultrafiltration, what is happening during ultrafiltration? Since the blood is passing in this, glomerular capillaries at a very high pressure and because of these two special characteristics of the glomerular capillaries, what is happening? Uh, adequate amount of liquid substance of the blood. Adequate amount of the liquid substance of the blood starts oozing out and a large amount of large number of ions and salts starts diffusing. So as a result, after some time we come across that there is a fluid starts getting accumulated, some fluid starts getting accumulated where? In the concavity. A fluid starts accumulating. Now I already told you that this inner lining of the Bowman's capsule is perforated. The inner lining is perforated. So if I talk about this inner lining, which is perforated and I am also saying that certain amount of liquid is getting accumulated. So if certain amount of liquid is getting accumulated, will it remain here for a long time? No, on top of that the inside is hollow. So this liquid will start entering inside the hollow of the tube. Yes or no? This liquid, which is this liquid now? The liquid which is formed by the process of Ultrafiltration. What is this liquid known as? This liquid or this fluid is now known as the glomerular filtrate. What is this liquid known as? The fluid that is formed known as as a result of ultrafiltration. The liquid part of the blood is oozing out along with a whole lot of ions and salts and proteins known as glomerular filtrate. I said the blood is now moving. The blood is now passing through this efferent, efferent arterio. The blood is at a very high pressure. What is the reason for the pressure? The hydrostatic pressure that is developed because of the greater yeah. diameter of efferent and the narrow diameter of the efferent. Now the blood is passing through these capillaries and now the capillaries has got these two special properties. The blood which is rushing, will all the blood just move away to the efferent? No. But since it has got pores and the wall very thin, the liquid part of the blood just moves away. The liquid part of the blood just moves away, salts and ions just diffuse away and start getting collected in the concavity, in the depression of the Bowman's capsule. Starts getting collected in the depression of the Bowman's capsule, something like this. What is this fluid known as? This fluid is known as the glomerular filtrate. What is the composition of the glomerular filtrate if we have to understand? The glomerular filtrate has got a large amount of water, it has got sodium ions, it has got a lot of glucose and it has got various other different types of salts, proteins and etc. much lesser. RBCs are, are there? RBCs? No, they cannot come out through the capillary pore. Platelets? Are they there? No, they cannot come out through the capillary pore. Accidentally, some WBCs may come out, but since it is not a case of infection, so WBCs will not come out by the characteristic process of diapedesis. So, no concept of diapedesis here. So, here for the time being, we understand that what would happen now? What is the uh, product formed after ultrafiltration? The first step, glomerular filtrate. And how much of the glomerular filtrate generally forms uh, on, a, on an average? 160 to 180 liters per day. 160 to 180 liters per day of glomerular filtrate that would be possible only when a specific amount of the blood gets filtered again and again and again and in almost about 24 hour time it is that same amount of blood which gets filtered almost about 350 to 400 times. So it is the same small amount of blood if you measure a specific amount of blood is not getting filtered only once in a day, but almost about 400 times in a day. So if you, if you understand that this 180 liters of fluid is formed and gathered, but we don't drink only that much of water. We drink hardly about three liters of water in a day. 
And now I'm saying so much of the glomerular filter is getting formed because it is taking place all throughout the day in a span of 24 hours and little, little, little small amount every time getting formed. And also because the blood is getting, any amount of blood is getting filtered almost about 400 times. That's why. Okay, so now this is ultrafiltration. What did we learn? Why does ultrafiltration happen? Where does ultrafiltration happen? What does ultrafiltration give rise to? So now we have the glomerular filtrate and this glomerular filtrate will start running down the PCT now. Now the glomerular filtrate is all in the PCT. But what is the composition of the glomerular filtrate? Then also we have to take a note here. I said the glomerular filtrate has got a whole lot of water, has got a whole lot of sodium ions, has got a whole lot of glucose. So much of water has been given away by the process of ultrafiltration that the blood which is running away by the way of efferent arteriole, the blood which is running away by the way of the efferent arteriole is comparatively thicker. So much of water is given away. Almost about 80% of the water is lost from the blood during the process of ultrafiltration. So the blood here is lighter, watery consistency. The blood here is always thicker. Now, we have to compare that what is happening uh, <clears throat> between this tubular portion of the nephron. So I could divide, let us consider that the tubular portion of the nephron I divide like this. I say this is the PCT and this is the loop of family and this is the DCT. I'm just dividing this entire portion of the tubule into three major parts. The PCT, the loop of family and the DCT. But surrounding this tubular portion, what is there? Surrounding the tubular portion, the blood capillaries are there. How do I understand? How do I correlate with this blood capillaries? I have to understand that this efferent arteriole, of course, will result in the formation of a blood capillary. And is it not all the blood capillaries are actually running uh, passed by these different type of uh, portions of the tubular part? Yes. So it is an extension of the efferent arteriole only which is forming this capillaries. So now this capillary that I draw here, which capillary did I draw? Did I draw here the basa recta? Did I draw here the uh, peritubular capillaries? Yes, I am drawing here the basa recta and trying to find out that what is actually happening between the blood of the efferent arteriole and the three portions of the tubular uh, part of the nephron. So right now we start with the second step and what is the second step? The second step that we have to understand, the second process that we have to understand is selective reabsorption. What happens in selective reabsorption? Try understanding. Now that in the PCT there's a whole lot of water passing. There's a whole lot of water running down. There's a whole lot of uh, sodium glucose running down. But this PCT is very much permeable to water. It can allow the movement of water. The PCT is extremely permeable to water. So water concentration is much more here. I already told you the blood in the efferent arteriole is comparatively thick, meaning the amount of water is much lesser. Here in the PCT, the amount of water is more. So the water constantly starts diffusing. The water constantly starts diffusing. What about the sodium and the glucose? Yes, a whole lot of sodium and glucose transport also happens because the PCT is now known to have a whole lot of sodium and glucose as in comparison with the surrounding blood capillary. So yes, I understand a reabsorption. What is the meaning of reabsorption? Diffusion of substances from one region to the blood. Why do we say reabsorption? Why not only absorption? Reabsorption because the substances are going back to the blood. From the kidney tubules, the substances are going back to the blood. Now, in this process, I say that what is actually happening, the first phase of selective reabsorption is what? The first phase of selective reabsorption is a whole lot of water, sodium, glucose going towards the blood. And this has been brought about by a hormone known as ADH. What is ADH? ADH is antidiuretic hormone and this antidiuretic hormone is released by 
the pituitary gland the pituitary gland produces this hormone and this is what is responsible for this reabsorption so now a whole lot of water sodium and glucose has already started moving but still the loop of hanley by the time the fluid passes down the loop of hanley still an adequate amount of water is left still some amount of sodium glucose proteins are still left so in the loop of hanley the water reabsorption continues the sodium ion reabsorption continues which of those substances which are maximally reabsorbed in the pct sodium glucose water what are some of the substances mad mini the fluid which is running down the substances are constantly moving towards the blood because from a region of high to a region of low concentration that is what is happening by the time the filtrate has moved down now tell me the filtrate here and the filtrate here does it have the same composition no so much of the water and the salts and the ions and the proteins have already gone back to the blood so this fluid is no more known as now this fluid we had named as glomerular filtrate but this fluid we will not name it as the glomerular filtrate rather this is known as the tubular filtrate because the composition is not the same like before composition has changed now this tubular filtrate is still undergoing the process of reabsorption of sodium water maximally and a whole lot of water starts moving down but now we also have to understand that yes by the time the filtrate is in the loop of hanley maximum reabsorption of water sodium glucose ions have already happened but what is down there in the blood in the blood we come across that a whole lot of potassium ions which are toxic to the body are still remaining the uh, water soluble vitamins are still remaining the uric acid is still remaining in large amount the urea is remaining in large amount in the blood but why could not they come from the blood to the pct no they cannot because the wall of the pct and the blood capillaries both are rather the wall of the pct is impermeable to all these substances why not at the loop of hanley because the wall of the loop of hanley does not allow the movement of all these substances the wall of the, P, the pct and the loop of hanley are impermeable to potassium ions urea uric acid ammonium compounds etc creatinine etc etc so the blood was uh in the pct when i compare no all the substances still remain in the blood when i compare the blood vessels and the loop of hanley why don't they pass the side because this part and this part does not allow the movement of the urea uric acid potassium creatinine because the membranes are impermeable they don't allow the transport of this but now that i compare the tubular part that is the vasa recta with that of the dct the dct being permeable a whole lot of these substances starts entering from the blood towards the tubular part of the nephron from the blood so now the potassium ions come in a whole lot of vitamins soluble vitamins come in and a whole lot of drugs and poisons now drugs and poisons here refer to all the different type of toxic chemical substances that enter our body from time to time that can be the medicines or the preservatives or any other intoxicants of course now all these unwanted uh, poisonous substances which were still remaining in the blood starts moving down but at the level of dct not pct and loop of hanley now the fluid which is now present in the dct what would be the composition of the fluid the fluid which is now present in the dct is majorly urea uric acid water soluble vitamins drugs poison potassium ions and a small amount of water which is just necessary to dissolve all these toxic substances small amount of water which is just necessary to dissolve all these toxic substances but now that we talk about small amount of water remember still we write 95% of water and a whole lot of solids so now when we are talking about that what is the substance or what is uh, the fluid containing what is this filtrate containing now 
the filtrate which is now running down into the collecting duct is what is termed as urine. And here in the BCT, it is known as the forming urine because the reabsorption process is still going on. Forming urine, and now the one which has come down into the collecting duct, urine. What is the composition? So if I have to talk about the composition of the urine here, it will have small amount of water, it will have urea, it will have uric acid, it will have potassium ions, water-soluble vitamins, certain different type of pigments. What pigment now? The eurochrome pigment, etc., etc. All these substances dissolve in a small amount of water. And this is what is the composition of the urine that is present in the collecting ducts. So, so far, I was talking about reabsorption and the last step that I had, uh, had been talking about, what is this? This is what is the process termed as tubular secretion. Then what is actually a major difference between selective reabsorption and secretion? If I talk about selective reabsorption, we are talking about substances moving from PCT and loop of Hanley towards the blood vessel. If I talk about secretion, we understand diffusion of substances from blood vessel towards the DCT. Vasa recta towards the DCT. Understood? Which hormone is responsible for the process of reabsorption? ADH. ADH. So if a person does not have adequate amount of ADH in the blood, uh, the secretion of the water is more, the release of the urine is more for that person. If the person does not have ADH, then this process is not happening. This process is not happening. This also roughly not happening because sodium molecules as it is, they will not move. They will move in the dissolved form. So now when I talk about that if a person does not, does not have adequate amount of ADH, then the water reabsorption is minimum. Or say the other way, water reabsorption minimum meaning the water in the blood is becoming much lesser. The water is much lesser in the afferent artery. I like already told you the blood is thick. So in this person who has a deficiency of ADH, the blood remains thicker always. And the amount of water in the kidney tubules remain maximum. And this person always has got a higher tendency of urination, a condition known as diuresis, and the person is supposed to suffer from diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is a condition where the person is frequently urinating because reabsorption may be work. Maximum amount of water is still in the kidney tubules. The person always has a tendency of urination, a condition known as uh, I'm sorry, a condition known as diuresis, which is the most important symptom of diabetes insipidus and which has happened because of the deficiency of ADH. But now, if normally ADH is there and the process of reabsorption is happening, then what do you understand? What is the most important benefit of reabsorption? To bring back the volume of the blood. I already told you, the water content of the blood becomes massively disturbed after the process of ultrafiltration. The blood was thick. Now the blood is slowly, slowly regaining its amount of water. So the volume of the blood, which is almost about five to six liters, should be, yes, the volume of the blood is properly getting restored because it is getting so much of water back. It is now again in the fluid state. What is the composition of the blood? The process of reabsorption, what is the benefit it does? It brings back the composition of the blood to stable. It brings back the volume of the blood stable. You are asked a question, what is the significance of selective reabsorption? Your answer should be selective reabsorption is very much necessary to bring about the, to maintain the volume and the composition of the blood. Just imagine a person who is suffering from diabetes insipidus. Since the blood is so thick, <clears throat> there is a constant urge of drinking water. There's a constant urge of drinking water. And now if he does not drink adequate amount of water, the body may start collapsing because the blood once thick, the process of circulation will be disturbed. Blood circulation is disturbed. So now when we are talking about forming urine, where is forming urine? DCT 
and where is uh, in which part of the excretory system the word urine can be first used collecting that and now when we talk about that this entire process is under hormonal control the process of uh, ultra filtration reabsorption but now if i talk about that is it is it very normal if i understand that there is a huge amount of glucose in the urine i understand that there is a huge amount of proteins present in the urine there are some rbc cells present in the urine will that be considered as a normal condition no that is not a normal condition at all so let us try understanding that what would be some of the abnormal constituents of the urine what are some of the abnormal constituents of the urine abnormal constituents of the urine would be the first one hematuria when the blood uh, cells are present in the urine which is mainly because of some urinary tract infection or some tumor etc and where rbc is found in the urine which is not normal rbc should not be there in the urine at all the urine should never be damaged in that glycosuria a condition when the amount of glucose become too much normally should glucose be there in the urine in traces it should be there in traces it should be there but when the glucose is too much present excessive diabetes mellitus hyperglycemia these are the conditions diabetes insipidus we already discussed what is diabetes insipidus when uh, there is an deficiency of adh and the reabsorption and cannot happen reabsorption cannot happen and what is diuresis are told diuresis is a condition when frequent urination would happen now osmoregulation that we had talked about is osmoregulation a separate process altogether no now that the process of ultra filtration and tubular uh, reabsorption and all this was happening the process of the process of maintenance of the salt and the water balance was as it is taking place and this is what we talk about is it not the maintenance of the salt and the water balance in the blood is it not taking place parallelly yes this is what we are talking about as osmoregulation this is what is osmoregulation then next is uh, we look into some <coughs> concepts like how would a person uh, how would a person survive if a part of the kidneys or one complete kidney or when almost about 75% of the kidneys are not working then the person has to go for a process of dialysis hemodialysis where artificially the blood has to be filtered but for that the blood has to be drawn out from a radial artery there's a artery here in the body radial artery from where the blood has to be drawn out into a series of tubes into a series of tubes and the blood runs in this series of tubes and the tubes will have a permeability something like the dct the tube should have permeability something like the dct meaning what meaning that if i talk about this system of tubes say suppose now this is the system of tubes through which the blood passes this is the system of tubes through which the blood passes now if i talk about that these tubes are the ones through which the blood is passing uh then what should be the permeability the permeability i said it should be something like the dct meaning the blood is passing in these tubes and the blood should allow or this tube should allow i'm sorry the blood is passing in these tubes and uh, as the blood passes in these tubes what type of movement should these tubes allow the tube should very much allow the movement of urea and uric acid definitely so the permeability of these tubes which are artificially tissue tubes this tubes has got a permeability same like the dct they should allow the movement but movement outwards at the same time if i look into i said that this will be from the radial artery and the blood is drawn inside and the entire apparatus has a structure something like this where outside the tube there is a solution also known as the dialyzing solution if you see here the background is blue you know that's a fluid and whatever the fluid basically uh, the the saline is used the dextrose or the sodium chloride saline is used now this urea uric acid that is coming out from this tube should get dissolved in this fluid 
in the sodium chloride solution should get dissolved here now that it gets dissolved here possible no that if this experiment or this is uh, this is a process which happens almost in about uh, 8 to 10 hours 6 to 8 hours 7 hours 5 hours depending on the body of the country the condition of the body and the age of the patient so this uh, fluid should not have a higher now say suppose i talk about this process going on for the last 5 hours so what is possible it is possible that the urea concentration here becomes more now progressive urea diffusion happening and if the urea concentration becomes more here backward diffusion may also start so that should not be allowed the concentration of the urea here should always be less so for this what has to be done every couple of hours what is to be done this dialyzing solution has to be replaced the process is going on the dialyzing solution is replaced and new dialyzing solution is always filled in so not allowing the urea concentration here built up because the backward diffusion we don't want and after the process of filtration the blood is again given back to the body this process artificial dialysis or hemodialysis takes place in different conditions at different time period uh, we also come across people where uh, under extreme condition the person has to go the patient has to go for dialysis every day 15 days 7 days gap twice a day depending on what the body condition of the patient is so next is we look into that after the concept of dialysis Okay, something more that I want you to go through here. You may just stick here in your textbook. Uh, those conditions, just check. I'll just show you some important. This I already explained. Now this is the diagram that we'll practice. Uh, next is the definitions. Now this properties of the urine. You may tick in your textbook. Sometimes you get MCQ or sometimes uh, the true false uh, or one out of this question based on this uh, simple concept. Mixturation I already told you was a definition. Color of the urine, the volume of the urine, and the pH of the urine. What is the pH of the urine? That also you have to take a note. And uh, the abnormal conditions. These abnormal conditions are I already showed you. What is the amount of the urine? That is released. The amount of the urine that is released is something around maximally two liters per day. I am talking about two liters per day, and here I am talking about one eighty liters of glomerular filtrate. So, what is the extent of reabsorption? The extent of reabsorption is almost about ninety eight percent. Which hormone brings about the extent of ninety eight percent of reabsorption of the water salt glucose? ADH. ADH. Let us do some questions. Check if anything is left. First of all, those progress checks. For Selina, you have to do the other one. Look into those exercises. Try solving the questions. Uh, difference between difference between. See here. Uh, describe ultra filtration definition. You should be able to remember ultra filtration reabsorption. You will try number four from the other book. Number four, number seven. Complete the following. Number four, number seven. Complete the following. Number nine, number ten, number eleven, number seven, seventeen. Uh, I'm sorry. Number seventeen, number eighteen, number twenty, eighteen, nineteen. I'm sorry, nineteen. All questions from time to time you should solve. As of now, I am giving you this. Selina, all questions. Come on, start. Selina, no option. Already questions are very less.
one way. You start, you don't have the textbook, no? Right. Here's one way. Complete those questions now. Selena, all the progress check. And uh, from the diagram based question as of now, uh, name the following C that we have done. Write the full form. Choose the odd one. He, uh, give reason. Give reason one already I gave you. E sub number one, three, four, five. So, what happened? Sadhu Vaskali, you all know, not Sadhu. Seventh day, you all are using this book, no? Yes. Anybody who does not have a younger brother, sister, Sadhu Vasu students. You are from Sadhu, no, seventh day, I'm sorry, seventh day people. How many of you are there? Younger brother, sister, hey. So after you finish your tenth, no, you will donate this book to UT. Mm -hmm. You have, you have, ah, so you will be in your. In case siblings may he have, you will give the book to UT. I need that book. But see that your book is in a good condition. No? Mm -hmm. uh, from the structure question, make the part of the building which collects urine for the source end from the Is it easy? Collects urine from the for the very first time. Collects uh, from the nephrons. Collecting that. On the part of the pregnant woman, where the term urine is first used for the pregnant woman, DPT. Your term urine is first used in the DCT. It is actually forming urine. Ha! Huh, though we use the word urine, but it is termed as forming urine. Remove of ammonia. Uridicity. Remove of ammonia. Ammonification. Ammonification. Three main parts of your urinary system. Three main parts. Kidneys, ureter, urinary bladder. Inorganic waste in the body. Urea, uric acid, ammonia. But ammonia is formed in our body in very small amounts. What those are creatinine. Creatinine is Organic waste. Also. Uh, inorganic. What is it? Inorganic. That becomes inorganic. Organic. Inorganic. 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 
Then inorganic ammonium salts, ammonium ions, sodium ions, potassium ions. Broad. What is it? Can the the white blood cells. That's what I explained to you. White blood cells occasionally, but not a regular process because diabetes is it will not work here. Diabetes is the WBC will only show when there is an infection on the other side. Otherwise, they will not generally squeeze out and come. But yes, accidentally some cells may be there, but we don't consider that as a prominent component there. What is the question? The glomerular uh, fluid consists of many substances such as water, salts, glucose, and micro-colloids. True, false. Yeah. True, false. Why don't you generate? Hmm. I have a question. About two minutes. Number? About this one. About one. Enough. 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 About dash million dash are present in each one. About two million nephrons. Two million. One million, one million. One million. One million. What is given? 1 million total? 1.25. Huh? Uh, so roughly we say 2 million also. Let me check, check exactly what number is given in your book. In this book? Yeah. Selena, what is given? Number of uh, nephrons. Exactly what is given the number? Maybe in the yellow box, blue box or something. Check. In the blue box, probably check somewhere. Total number of nephrons. Structure in the What is the total number of nephrons given? Selena, just check. Total number of nephrons. One million in each kidney. What is written? Ah, it is 2 million. You all write 2 million. That's better. Selena answers for this book. You should generally uh, follow much. 2 million. Roughly around 2 million nephron because it is 1 million per kidney. <laughs> Two million nephrons. Acha, what is in each? They are saying. Yeah, then uh, one, one million, million nephrons in each kidney. Huh? One million nephrons in each. Now, my thing is to be in the river. Photosynthesis. If there are no algae, no fishes in the sea, 
the fishes require to survive respiration respiration would require what oxygen, oxygen. 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 now no algae meaning this algae also they have got chloroplast in them they can take in carbon dioxide undergo the process of photosynthesis and release oxygen so if the algae are not there in the water the amount of dissolved oxygen would be much less so the survival of the fishes would be very very difficult so this algae are actually adding on to the amount of oxygen in the water because they come to the surface of the water uh, this uh, algae they come to the surface of the water again the reason is that they have the chloroplast and they have to undergo the process of uh, photosynthesis so they would generally come to the surface to absorb adequate amount of sunlight because in the deeper layers of the water body sunlight does not penetrate complete all these exercises you have to complete those questions find out if there is a doubt in any of the question all these questions of the textbook not even a single question of the textbook you should leave and solve every question of the textbook of the volume you should solve okay. this inner lighter the inner lighter light colored region of the kidney medulla all done the volume also has got so many questions when you read this chapter take out the volume and try solving not all at a time not all in the same day but from time to time keep solving uh, again i say not even a single question of your text and not even a single question of your volume you should leave every chapter try solving all of those because the volume also has got board questions so many board paper questions are chapter wise arranged and given there so go through all those questions once we finish our portion if you are able to finish on time then one or two lectures i will take that so by the time you can go ahead with chapter wise questions any doubt excess uric acid uh, when you talk about excess uric acid uric acid starts uh, accumulating between the tubular regions of the kidneys and uh, they get a little bit crystalline in form they they get crystalline and they result in the formation of small masses which is which are known as kidney stones now if that happens uh number one the flow of the blood and also the flow of the fluid from the kidney both are disturbed and this results once the kidney functions are disturbed so many other functions uric acid also starts getting deposited on the at the joints ankle knee resulting in conditions known as the gout uric acid gout that is called so those uh, disorders i think i forgot to mention just go through those disorders also kidney stones and gout can you see those so it's not really for constipation kidney stones yeah. no no not no nothing that has got nothing to do with constipation
Location of ureter. Location of ureter between the kidney and the bladder. Urinary bladder. Uh, urinary bladder, you'll have to write in the abdominal region. In the lower abdominal region, urinary bladder. Urethra. Uh, location of urethra. Below the urinary bladder. Just check exactly what is given. Urethra parts. Given? The location is not given. The location of urethra should always be written uh, between or below the bladder. Just give you a book. Let me check one uh, one feature. Give you a book. Floor of the bladder to the exterior. Floor of the bladder to the exterior of the body. Floor of the bladder to the exterior of the body. Pencil. Floor of the bladder to the exterior of the body. Complete this question answers. Whatever question you have a doubt with when you complete, all of you should complete those questions. Put a circle in all those questions where there's a doubt and tell me the next class. Pot and the soil uncovered because basically now since we have already uh, tightened the uh, tightened the plastic or the shear at the stem part, even if the process of evaporation is happening, it is not affecting the amount of evaporation. It is not affecting the amount of water we are getting. At this point, uh, with the entire pot, we want to then we have to blast it with the polythene cover. The surface of the soil. Here it does not matter because we want to study transformation from the plant and we have wrapped up the entire plant. So the water loss by the plant is what we are only considering. We can't even have most of that.